I won't be doing any yelling at you. Um, what I would like to do is have more of a more of a conversation as opposed to me just up here lecturing and talking about things that I think are important because what I think is important and what you think is important may be different. So I would rather uh, visit about what you guys care about. But I will give you uh, a little bit of a, a background on me. So uh, I'm the state representative from the 134th district, which now covers uh, southwest Springfield in the city of Battlefield. So you can kind of see the area of town that that district covers. And uh, not very big, but very compact in population size. So one of the interesting things about state house districts, and you, you probably know this already, is that each district has about 37 or 38,000 people. Um, so you have some districts that are massive. Some are bigger than a lot of states. And then you have others that are pretty small. So mine's one of the smaller districts in land area of any district in the state, but it's, it's densely populated. Uh, was first elected last cycle in 2020. So finished my first term in the House. And um, it, it's crazy to think, but here, here we are in another election cycle already. So running for re-election for what would be my, uh, my full second term. By way of background, born and raised in Springfield, lived here my whole life other than a few semesters away when I was over in Illinois for law school. And then after graduating law school, have uh, came back to Springfield and have practiced law as a local attorney since then. I mostly do work for, um, for businesses when they get sued in personal injury, wrongful death type lawsuits, but you get some other odds and end type cases that come across your desk, so I've handled quite a few <coughs> other things too. Um, been, uh, been married for over eight years now. I've got two little ones. I've got a boy who's three, a daughter who's almost two, and a son who's due in two weeks. Uh, so exciting times in the Riley house for sure. Um, at the same time, I'm trying to run a, run a campaign and uh, work on the law practice. So very, very, uh, very busy, but exciting times. So I've been involved in local politics for a long time. I first got involved when I was about 12 years old. Did not come from a, a political activist family at all. They voted, um, but that was about it. Uh, but that was, so when I was 12, that was the 2002 election cycle. It was um, right after September 11th happened. So that certainly had an impact on uh, my young mind growing up and wanted to do something to try and uh, provide some sort of support for the country, some type of service. And uh, as a 12-year-old, you're somewhat limited in what you can do. But um, I got involved in, in our local political scene. So I uh, started knocking doors for candidates that I believed in, but I thought stood for the right things when I was 12, and have uh, worked on campaigns pretty much every cycle after that until I ran for office myself two years ago. Some of the things that I'm most passionate about and um, really what drove me to run in the first place are primarily economic issues, um, and, and especially issues related to poverty reduction. Um, a few reasons for that, but you know, here in Springfield, we have extremely high poverty rates, and growing up, you know, those rates I've I've only seen those rates increase over the past couple of decades, and that's something that's just never been acceptable to me, and I've been frustrated. But frankly, folks, I'll, a lot of folks in my party who I don't think have done a good job trying to focus on that issue. And uh, a lot of folks in the other party who I think do a better job of being aware of that issue, but um, I don't think propose solutions that really work. Um, so my, so, so I've, I've had kind of a two-tiered focus on what I've worked on in the House the first couple years. Um, with the policy bills that I filed, those are mostly focus on doing things to improve the economic conditions across the state, trying to do things to improve the overall economic climate. So that involves a lot of tax issues. It involves some regulatory issues, trying to get rid of uh, the bureaucracy when it makes sense. And, uh, and then also I deal with a lot of issues related with the court system, because that has a big impact on our, on our overall economic climate and our ability to grow jobs within the state, bring new jobs, and uh, try and give our folks that live here the best opportunity to be economically successful. And then I've also been um, blessed enough to be a, a member of the House Budget Committee, which is really that the House doesn't have a lot of 
leverage, a lot of ability to be extremely powerful, but the budget committee is probably the place where House members have the most ability to be impactful, um, especially if you can figure out how to be effective early. So I've used my role in the House Budget Committee to focus on poverty specifically in Springfield. And, and my way I've been doing that has been working with a lot of our really good nonprofits in Springfield who have proven track records of success with working alongside people every step of the way, figuring out what success looks like to them, and helping put them on the path to success. So I think that approach of putting some state investment in those types of nonprofits has proven over time um, to be a lot more uh, effective in helping people get out of tough economic situations if they want to, rather than a lot of the, the big government social services programs, which I think are well-intentioned, but I don't think they do a very good job of helping people get out of, uh, out of poverty, to be honest. I think the, uh, the data that we've seen over the past several decades backs that up. So that's been my focus. <coughs> Excuse me. My, my focus the uh, first couple years in the House have seen a lot of success with that and certainly hope to build on that success going forward. You know, at, we only have eight years that we can be in the House, um, and that's if the voters elect you for that full eight years. So you don't have a lot of ability to be, it, or a lot of time to be impactful. But going into your, what, what you call your sophomore term, and then your junior term, are when House members are usually the most, they have the most ability to be impactful. That's where they have the most political leverage. So um, hopefully I'll be able to build on the success that I've gained in my first couple years and uh, the relationships that I built hopefully be even more effective and build on some of the things we've done going forward should the voters choose to send me back here in November. So that's probably enough uh, for talking for probably about 10 minutes, so that's probably long enough, so I'm gonna shut up. and. Let's hear what you all have to say, what kind of questions you have. Happy to take any questions. Nothing is, uh, is off limits. I have a reputation for being a pretty straight shooter. It's probably gonna cost me election one of these days, hopefully not yet, but uh, happy to take any questions. Nothing's off limits. Can we start with the, we'll also have a Democratic speaker eventually. Why identify with the party, with the Republican party and not some other party? Yeah, so for me, it's, it's really based on that limited government and um, that's gotten to be a bit of a tricky issue within the Republican Party because I, I think really the Republican Party is, is fractured between two or three or maybe more parties. You have more of your populist wing, which would be your, your Trump-style folks, and you all know this, but the, the populist movement throughout American history is interesting because it's kind of shifted between parties. And right now it's more of a, you have more folks that are in that Republican brand that probably are carrying the populist banner, but it's been interesting that that ideology has shifted over time between the parties. Um, I'm not a populist, I'm, I'm a true limited government conservative. Even, even probably a lot of my house colleagues would consider me more libertarian. So to be honest, I, I fight with my house colleagues probably about as much as I do with my Democrat colleagues because I don't care if it's a bill that's filed by a Republican or a Democrat. If it's what I consider a big government bill, I usually don't like it. So, um, but, but at its heart, that's really what it is. is I, I believe in limited government. I think that individuals know better how to live their lives than politicians and bureaucrats and state capitals or in federal capitals do. So that, that's what it is at its heart. And I would like to open up this conversation to the rest of the class, but before we do, um, I have six classes. I can't ask you to present to all six of them. So five other ones wrote in a ton of questions. That's Some of these are just fantastic. But before we even get to those, probably the biggest ticket item happening right now is that House just had, actually the General Assembly just had a special session. We don't need to get into what that is, but Missouri had, what was it, $5 billion surplus? Correct. And trying to figure out what to do with that extra money. There's always push and pull between, well, we should give it back to the people in terms of tax cuts, or we should invest it in other services. Where did the House come down? How do you feel about where the House came down? So ultimately, the, what, what we passed out of the legislature was a bill that reduces the current the current Missouri income tax rate, which is sitting at 5.3%, down to 4.95%, which that 
takes place automatically in January. And then over a series of time, if state revenues continue to stay strong like they are now, then there, there are a number of triggers built in, which will reduce that rate even further to drop it down to 4.5% ultimately. So once it's fully implemented, you're talking about about a billion dollar tax cut. Um, and, and I think that I, I was in strong support of that. I think the way we did it was also strong because we made sure that we weren't putting the state in a, a fiscal problem if the economy could, continues to be in, in a tough spot, if state revenues start to, uh, dec if they start to decline, then the trip, then we won't have further tax cuts. Everything will kind of level out and stay where it is until things start improving again. So I think we did a, we did a good job of having a balanced approach, recognizing, hey, we've got, we frankly, record revenues. Our folks back home are struggling under inflation right now. We at the state level are fairly limited on what we can do to combat inflation, but this is a tool that we had in our toolbox to say, well, we'll try and do what we can to give the folks back home a little bit of relief, try and help with the high gas prices, and in my case, the high diaper costs and things like that that we're dealing with. So, so that's ultimately what we passed, and I think we did it with a good balanced approach. I actually forgot to congratulate you. Congratulations on oh, your kid coming down yeah, pipeline. Thanks. Uh, hopefully everything is great and healthy there. One of the, I do want to walk through a couple of the most commonly asked questions for these questions that were written in. This one comes from Sam Lammers, who's in the 9 a.m. class. Do you feel, I'm quoting Sam, do you feel as though the recent decisions for Roe v. Wade will make a positive impact or negative impact for the women living in Missouri? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't know that it will change a whole lot for the, for the women living in Missouri. Uh, even before the Dobbs decision and Roe was overturned, we had seen a, a lot of reduction in um, our abortion rates in Missouri. So I don't know that there's going to be too much change, to be honest, in the day-to-day -day lives of most Missourians as a result of that case because of some of the prior bills that prior legislatures passed even before I was serving. Related to that, a question from Haley Lee, who's in an 11 a.m. class. On your personal website, she says, you said that you feel that the government is too active in people's health care and should limit itself. Uh, would your, so related specifically to, um, to abortion-related policy, would your party be willing to remedy the problems, um, abortion-related problems, by expanding access to birth control, contraceptions, um, sex education, which she says are statistically supported to reduce pregnancy rates, or do you feel this would be too active? I think most of those things are widely available already. Uh, we have a lot of programs in place in the state already, as well as federal programs, where if you have people that don't, that for whatever reason don't believe they have the financial means to afford those, I think a lot of that's already in place already. So I don't know that the state needs to do more work in that birth control space, to be honest. Uh, Spencer Carney, but you and I were talking at the top of class about some of these ballot issues that are coming up, and, and Spencer Carney wants to ask you specifically from the 10 a.m. class how you feel about the marijuana initiative on the ballot. So I am pretty skeptical of that marijuana initiative. I'm not inherently opposed to marijuana legalization. I, I, I do have some concerns about it. So there are, there are a couple with marijuana legalization generally and then with the initiative itself more specifically. So I, I'm not totally sure that, that the data that we've seen come out of states that have passed it recreationally it, is showing good results. I'm not sure that it's showing, uh, I, I have concerns that we're seeing increased crime, um, we're seeing increased uh, impairment, for people that are driving uh, impaired on the roads when law enforcement right now doesn't really have a way to test for impairment with, uh, with marijuana. So I, I would like to see a little more data conclusively from those states that shows, you know, are, are we seeing increased crime? Are we seeing increased issues? Before I'm, I'm ready to say, yep, yeah, Missouri, go for it. Let's do it. Um, again, you know, if, if it's, again, as someone who is more libertarian and wants uh, government out of individuals' lives, if you're doing something in your own home, I really don't care. Um, it's more of the concerns of what happens when you have impaired folks out on the road and, and no ability to really 
address that issue yet. That's my biggest concern. With the marijuana initiative that is on the ballot, that's an interesting one because you have the folks who have been working on it <coughs> legislatively um, that, that have been and kind of a bipartisan group that has all come out very much in opposition to the issue on the ballot. So a few issues that come up there is um, it creates a really interesting regulatory framework that may not result in uh, as many individuals and businesses being able to get into that space to, uh, to sell. There may be um, some, some government picking winners and losers and favoring specific, specific entities as a result of that thing passing if it does pass. So it's not really a complete opening of the market, which would be one of my big concerns with that particular initiative. Now, you've already kind of answered this next question, but we had uh, two people ask the exact same question, Anna Brand Anna Brandell from 9 a.m. and Aiden Sykes from 10 a.m. They both asked the exact same question because you, you just spoke earlier about how poverty reduction is a, is a big emphasis of yours. And so they both asked why you voted yes on reducing unemployment benefits. Uh, how does that play into your philosophy and what you think is best for the state? Yeah, so the, the issue there is making sure that you have a good safety net that's there to help people get through tough times without being something that people stay on it and live on because that's not a good use of taxpayer dollars. So the idea with the, uh, the bill that we worked on this year and in, in prior years is to make sure that we have that robust um, unemployment insurance safety net there but to make sure that you, you don't have people who are just getting on there and taking unfair advantage of the system. So I'm, I will ask one more question. I just anybody who's interested in weighing in, like as you can see, uh, uh, Representative uh, uh, Riley is very open to answer anything you may be curious about. This probably the number one question I got sent in to me, sir, was about the prescription drug monitoring program. This is from Rebecca Webb, an online student. She says. Uh, why did you vote no on establishing that prescription drug monitoring program? She argues that our state is ranked one of the highest for drug abuse. I feel as if we monitor the drugs that are being prescribed and we can figure out what and where the problem is to make changes on how we can fix and use other methods. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So that is a bill that passed in my first year and I did vote no on it, but it, it, it did pass and it is the law of the land now. So my concern with that was how overbroad it was. The, the monitoring, so the idea behind it is to make sure that you don't have um, you know, folks that are going from doctor to doctor and, and getting drugs and, and overdosing. The problem is, well, there are a couple of them. The, it's so overbroad that it's not just focused on those particular drugs. So I was concerned about patient privacy and having all this, this information about individuals private health information in a big government database that could be um, you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for abuse to have that intimate knowledge of an individual's conditions in a government database so because it was so overbroad as far as basically any types of prescriptions that a person was on not just those opioids and some of the hot uh, the more concerning issues um, were being tracked that's why I voted no Anybody, any questions off the top of your mind you might be interested to ask? All right, good. So I, I saw you first. I think your name is Alex. So My name is Alex. So I like the name. I'll go with you first. All right. So I noticed that you voted on reduced hospital visitation restrictions. And this affects me personally because I am a uh, psychiatric technician at Cox North. And just in this last month, um, we've seen this policy and this affect us greatly. We now have everyday every uh, visitation and we just don't have the staff to regulate in the site board and in the last month because of just the lack of staff that we've had we've actually had someone we have had, uh, we've had someone sneak in fentanyl and uh, their heart stopped on the unit and it just I it affects me personally I understand like throughout other wards but because of this policy it has really affects, affected us and it led to someone's heart stopping yeah I uh, appreciate the feedback on that that's helpful because um, there may be something we need to do to tighten that up a little bit. So obviously the idea with passing that was um, 
somewhat as a response to what we saw during COVID where people were you know, going into the hospital and had no advocate with them. And hospitals are great, they do amazing work. My parents are both nurses, but somewhat limited based on staffing and things like that of, of how, um, how involved you can be with a patient all the time. So a lot of folks in the legislature thought that um, making sure that a patient had an advocate with them to make sure that they were okay would be, uh, would be an appropriate and important thing to do. So that was the idea behind the bill, was making sure that patients have advocates with them, um, you know, regardless of, of the circumstances for the most part. Though that bill did give hospitals um, some flexibility, but certainly if there are issues, some unintended consequences as a result of that legislation, we do need to know about that to see if there's tweaks that we need to make. So I, I appreciate you raising that for me. We'll definitely take a look at that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know how your experience as an attorney has affected what you've done as a legislator. So it's been it's been extremely helpful, to be honest. They're probably contrary to what most people think. There aren't very many attorneys in the legislature, and and certainly um, even fewer that actually actively practice law. You have a few folks who earned a law degree and, and you know they pay their annual bar fees so they're technically an attorney but they have either never practiced or haven't practiced for a long time so um, I think as an attorney I'm, and I'm not saying this to just try and pat myself on the back but you, you, it does give you a little bit of a head start I think because we work with the law daily we argue the law daily we fight about what words mean and statutes mean and what what commas mean and um, when you're writing laws and arguing about how they're going to apply in real life. I think um, attorneys have a lot of, you know, a lot of experience and knowledge in that area just because of what we do daily. So a lot of our colleagues come to us when they're working on their bills, trying to say, you know, and ask us questions about, well, how is this going to work in real life? They have, you know, less sexy questions about how do you draft bills and um, make sure that they do what you're trying to actually make them do terminology yeah exactly right so I, I think it definitely gives um, attorney legislators probably do have a little bit of a, of a leg up a head start if you will when you're going into the legislature so we have actually had a lot of students write about something your legal background might be able to help us with uh, specifically about homelessness uh, because obviously we've seen some bills come down the pipeline to like restrict what exactly homeless can and can't do um, I had a student write, uh, with the obvious problem of drug-related crime and homelessness in Springfield, do you have a plan to counter these problems? Another student, Alana Livingston online, um, she says the governor made, there are designated camping places, but the governor may dispose of certain properties in the states. Uh, where do you intend, she asks, for the unhoused population to go? Yeah, so I think that ties in well with some of the things that we were talking about at the very beginning in my work on the budget committee to uh, provide a lot of, I mean, frankly, millions of dollars at this point in funding to some of our nonprofits in Springfield who are directly working with that population. Um, so that, to me, is some of the, one of the most tangible things that I can do that's already yielding results, is continuing to use my role on the House Budget Committee, the leverage I have there, the relationships I've built to put specific state dollars into the budget to tackle that issue in Springfield specifically. And uh, in your, if you were emperor of Missouri, what what would you do? What Where would you put that money for these homeless folks? Uh, so so I, I would scale up. There's, I'm not going to name them by name right now, but there's two or three, uh, maybe more than that, nonprofits in Springfield who do an absolutely fantastic job. And if I was emperor of Missouri and had a uh, a huge budget or an unlimited budget, I would scale those up as big as I could, put them in every you know location in the state, and give them the resources they need because they're actually getting the job done. Uh, more questions? Yes. So I heard from another question <clears throat> that on your website you said that you don't really want the government involved in personal health care. Why is like the overturn of Roe v. Wade different because I feel like that's just a lot of government invasion. Yeah, so I, I think this ultimately is a philosophical question. Do you believe a, a person is a, is a human being from the point of conception 
or do you think it's some point later on? So for me, and, and I, you know, I, I know in a, in a room of this size that there's going to be a lot of people that, that disagree with me that a, a person is a human being deserving of protection from the moment of conception. But that's what I believe. So as a conservative and even as a libertarian, you know, I don't like government involvement in much of anything, but I do think there is role for government in protecting the lives of humans. So that, that for me is why, um, and in most instances, I'm not okay with government intervention in much of anything, but I do believe government has a role in protecting people. Yeah. Um, she said something earlier about like programs implemented in schools and stuff to teach sex ed, and I don't know if I agree with you on like how um, we have like a good amount of that education, especially in like rural areas, and I think it's a lot with engagement because I've been doing a project like working on this, and rural teachers are often less engaged because they're paid less than the people in urban areas, and so they're also like the people in rural rural areas are living in poverty. So how does that, like they're not really getting the same advantage and so if they're dealing with like being pregnant or really just anything in general. Yeah, so uh, I'd love, if you have research you'd like to share, I'd love to see it to be honest, because I, I, no one has ever put something on my desk that says that that's really an issue that can back it up with actual data and research. So if, I mean, if you've got yeah, something, I'd love to take a look. There's a dime town, it's over a Dunkle County in Missouri. Yeah. And it was written in 2017. Okay. And then David Monk also wrote an article, I don't know where he's from, about the educational disparities between urban and rural yeah. areas. Yeah. Definitely big issues with the education disparities. Um, but I, I'd love to see some of that sex ed data, if you have it, and yeah, feel free to pass it along. Okay. We have a uh, question related to education. We got lots of education related questions. Yeah. This one is very zoom out. Okay, it's from Mackenzie Phillips. She asks, the education system is something we are always trying to improve and make better for students. Uh, what are some ways you want to help change the system for the better? So I think there are, there are two things. So in my time in the House, we've put um, record money into funding our, our traditional public education system. And I think that's certainly an important component of it. I don't think, though, that 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 is going to solve all the issues. I think no matter how much money you throw at something, you're still not going to solve everything. There's still going to be kids out there that even the best public school system in the world isn't going to fully serve. So for me, um, in addition to supporting, making sure we're funding the system, making sure we're giving teachers pay raises, which we did this past year, um, I, I, I support increasing educational choice options to uh, provide more funding for kids who don't, who, who public school is not the best option for them. So that would include, you know, opening up uh, um, private schools, uh, providing some some state scholarships to help kids that are in tough situations go to those types of schools. If, uh, for example, I was homeschooled kindergarten all the way through high school, um, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, providing some assistance for parents who want to uh, to homeschool their kids to pay for curriculum and things like that, because that's, uh, that's pretty expensive. So um, those, those I, I think we can do both of those things. I think we have started to make some progress on doing both of those things. And, uh, the past couple years, and I would expect those to start yielding some better results. Related to that, I already asked you, and I want to get to Tyler's question, uh, but I want to stay on education for at least one more question before we change subjects. I read you a question from Rebecca Webb earlier. She's got another great one that's relevant. Uh, she says she has a special needs sister, and her school is always closing down because they don't have enough staff to take care of them. She asks how we can pay and make sure our teachers are excited to go to work. Yeah, so I, I've been a vocal supporter of increasing teacher pay my whole time in the house. We'll continue to be. I, I don't think that we pay them enough. I think that we have currently have the revenues to do that. Um, especially, I, I would like to frankly see our teacher pay structure change a little bit where it's not just looking at uh, how many years someone has been serving as a teacher and what their educational attainment is, but something that really makes sure we're, we're rewarding those teachers who are going above and beyond to take care of our kids. Um, and, and you have folks like that that are working with those tougher populations that I think definitely deserve uh, 
certainly more than what they're currently seeing. Um, what was the other part of the question? There is the uh, she the wants to how can pay how can we make our teachers excited to go to work, which is something that. Um, I serve on the Missouri Community College Association, which is an interest group on behalf of community colleges. That's something we talk about all the time, is yeah. trying to gin up energy and excitement for instructors. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, that's, that's a really tough question, I think. I have a lot of public school teachers in my family, and some of them, this is antidotal, so take it for what it's worth, but a lot of them talk about how um, kids are just really tough to wrangle these days because of behavioral changes, family changes, things like that. I don't know quite what government can do to take care of some of those more societal issues that are causing perhaps um, struggles for student behavior, but I'm, I'm certainly open to any ideas. So that's one of those things that I, I always like, you know, let's open it up for discussion if people do have thoughts, because. I freely admit I don't know the answers to everything, but if I if I don't know the answer, I want to try and find someone who does and look at data and research that does have, or you know, something that does have some ideas. Do you have an idea? Well, I was just thinking about like for most teachers, they're very highly educated and underpaid typically. So a lot of them, like I've had friends who they taught high school for a few years but they like couldn't afford to continue doing it like if they have a spouse with health issues a lot of them work jobs on the side like tutoring or even cleaning um, so they're working like over 40 hours a week and so I think a lot of them just get burned out so yeah. if we could put more funding into paying teachers to where they can just have that one job and focus on it fully you know yeah I, th I, I think that's true and that's certainly something I, I'm supportive of I don't think that's a silver bullet, though, because I think yeah. we have a lot of professions, uh, I mean, mine included, that have a reputation for making a good living, but there's still a lot of burnt out. There's still a lot of burnout. So that that by itself isn't enough to keep someone there. I don't think. I think it does help, yeah. and I'm, I'm not a, I'm, and, and I'm very much in support of doing what we can there. I don't think it's a silver bullet, though. I think it's that plus something else plus maybe something else. Yeah. Yeah. But I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, in the, so in Crocker's question earlier, um, he he was asking if you were the emperor of Missouri, for instance, um, and you could do something to aid the homeless problem, the poverty problem in Missouri. Um, your answer would be to give cash infusions to um, nonprofit organizations that are already that work. designed. Yeah. That work. That right. work. Um, my question is, what is it that makes you believe that the resources that you would infuse these businesses with is more appropriate in the hands of a private organization than a public one? It's because of the results that they yield. And they they do more with a dollar than uh, than a lot of the government agencies that I work with. So when when I've gone and started and had meetings with our nonprofits, when I'm trying to decide, you know, are you one that I think is 